Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hello everyone, welcome to our Saturday Bible study. You know, it's, a, it's marvelous how the Holy Spirit, you know, suddenly changes things. You know, I, I have to disappoint some of you if you came today you know, after seeing my message, thinking it's going to be the second part about uh, Father's provision and the truth. Sorry to say it's not going to be that message because uh, you know, he works in funny ways. Not even 10 minutes after I put that message in the WhatsApp group, he started ministering to me from uh, Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 about how... Um, Pastor Bimal, I've even written the title in my book. Praise God. <laughs> Already for, for it, that. so I've got to cross it out. <laughs> ah, you need to take that to the Holy Spirit, Margo. <laughs> and let him answer you. Maybe in a couple of weeks' time, we can get okay. back into that into series. <laughs> But for today, we have to continue with what the Holy Spirit, you know, wants us to look at. Uh, it's about, you know, how Jesus, when he was teaching in Capernaum, how in the midst of fellow believers, there was another person. It's safe to say that he was also a believer who had an unclean spirit inside of him. And none of the other believers knew that this person had an unclean spirit. So for as long as the Holy Spirit wants us to be in this uh, topic so i believe the lord will get us into a new teaching series today and the topic for this teaching series is christians and demons christians and demons yes i know that you know that opened some of your eyes i saw some of your eyes like you know going wide open when you heard the title christians and demons you know, so we will look at today what we are going to look at is we are going to see this true incident that Mark records. And we are going to learn six or seven powerful things that we can learn from Jesus about dealing with demons. Because you need to understand, I've shared this before many a times, that just because you're a born again believer, that does not mean the enemy has stopped coming after you. You need to understand the day you gave your life to Christ, you became his property. You are heaven's property. You, know, you are heaven's possession. That does not mean that there are undealt issues in your life. It does not mean that a, a born again believer, even after becoming born again, it does not mean that they can't still have undealt issues in their life. They can, where they have maybe previously opened doors for demons to get into their lives and lives. Demons can still have or hold on to strongholds in Christians' lives. And the reason I believe the, why the Holy Spirit wants us to you know, dive into Mark chapter 1 is because even today there are Christians who are living in ignorance. And what does the Bible say about ignorance? Ignorance is a, a tool in the hands of the enemy. When a child of God is living in ignorance, what happens is they give an extra advantage for the enemy. Now, sad to say, there are Christians who think that uh, Satan is an imaginary being, a superstitious being. So I feel sorry for Christians like that because they haven't read the Bible. Jesus himself, he dealt with demons wherever he preached. When demons manifested, he dealt with them. And then you get this category of Christians. So I have also come across you know, quite a lot of Christians like them who don't believe that demons exist. So that is deception right there. The enemy has deceived Christians because as long as Christians are trapped behind that deception where they think that Satan is just an imaginary being, behind that deception, there's so much the enemy does. That is why deception is powerful. So today, we are going to look at Mark chapter 1. We will be reading from verse number 21 to 28. So I want to give this, uh, give you an opportunity, anyone who would like to you know, unmute and read to us, Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 28. Verses 21 up to 28. Can I read it, Pastor Bimar? Sure. Go for it. 
I'm reading from the NIV. Sure. <clears throat> they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives the orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bango. Thank you. I like how you, you raise your tone in some, some parts when you read scripture. You know, when you bring scripture to life more by doing that. <laughs> Isn't it amazing we can have fun while preaching? Glory be to his holy name. Now, what happened here? Jesus goes to Capernaum now and you find Jesus teaching in the synagogue. You know, it's like you go to church on a Sunday and it's like a Sunday setting. You go to your church, local church that you go to. And in the church, predominantly, you get believers. Yeah? People who have given their lives to the Lord. And amongst those people who have given their lives to the Lord was another fellow believer where none of the others knew that he was carrying an unclean spirit inside of him. And all of a sudden, while Jesus was teaching, this unclean spirit cried out of this person because this unclean spirit couldn't stand the power of Jesus. You need to understand wherever there is a strong presence of the Holy Spirit, demons manifest. That's where the anointing comes into the picture. The anointing drives out demons. So then this impure spirit, it, it cried out and Jesus dealt with the situation. So we are going to learn seven powerful things that we can learn from Jesus. We are not going to look at the man more than looking at the man who carried the unclean spirit. Our center focus, as always, is going to be Jesus because he's the only one that we can learn from. Number one, the first important lesson we can learn from Jesus is Jesus was interrupted but not disturbed in his spirit. Although Jesus was interrupted, he was not disturbed in his spirit. Now here is Jesus preaching, his teaching. Now let me ask you a question for those of you who share you know, the word of God. You teach in church, you teach in Zoom sessions, you do all that. When you are teaching, when you are sharing the word of God, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, if a demon manifests out of a person, what are you going to do? Now look at Jesus. Jesus, although his teaching session was interrupted, he was not disturbed in his spirit. The same way from time to time the enemy will come against us to interrupt very especially when God gives you his mandate when God shows you the vision and when the Holy Spirit gets you to do what God wants you to do and then when you are journeying in that particular season the enemy might try to do certain things to interrupt that flow this is exactly what happened Jesus was interrupted. His teaching was interrupted, but still he was not disturbed in his spirit. You know, sometimes when you are journeying in the will of God, when a negative answer comes your way from somewhere, does that disturb your spirit? It might try to interrupt, but that interruption will not be there for a long time. But you need to understand that you can't let that interruption affect your inner being. Jesus' teaching for a moment, it was interrupted, but he was not disturbed in his spirit. I'm going to read verses 23 and 24 in the same chapter from the Message Version. Suddenly, 
while still in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out, what business do we have here with us? What business do you have here with us, Jesus? I know that you are what you are up to. You are the Holy One of God and you have come to destroy us. Now there's the unclean spirit crying through this person to Jesus. And the Bible says, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out. That demon was disturbed. You know, when demons get disturbed, that's when they come against you. But you need to understand, their disturbers can't disturb you in your spirit. Let them be disturbed as much as they want. But don't let that disturb your inner being. You know, when it comes to the pattern of New Testament evangelism, we have to follow the pattern of Jesus. I will share more about that in a little while. The second important lesson is Jesus shut him up. Jesus shut the enemy. Verse number 25 and 26 says, Jesus shut him up, saying, quiet, get out of here. The afflicting spirit threw the man into spams, protesting loudly, and got out. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus shut him up. Now, the same way, how often do you shut the voices, the ungodly voices that you speak, that you hear talking to you other than the Holy Spirit? If you are a person who, who knows that you hear the enemy speaking to you, you need to sh shut those voices. God does not want you to have interactions, to have dialogues with demons. This is why even when a demon manifests, when you are praying for a person, it's very unhealthy, it's very dangerous to get into long conversations with demons. And there are, you know, pastors, evangelists, some you know, precious people who get into long, long, long conversations with demons and in that process of having that long conversation the enemy can deceive you because the enemy is full of lies don't forget what jesus said in john chapter 8 verse number 44 about satan jesus said he is the father of lies so in that process you can get deceived the same way you don't have to wait until you pray for a person for, for a demon to manifest when it comes to your mind if you know you are hearing the voice of the enemy from somewhere through demotivation through condemnation be it any negative thing you must learn to shut those voices because the more you get carried away by having a conversation with those voices the enemy is only deceiving you more and more so Jesus shut him up Jesus wasn't deceived by the interruption Jesus wasn't afraid of the interruption Neither was Jesus entertaining the interruption. You need to understand, whenever you hear the enemy trying to lie, you must not entertain those lies. That's how our minds work. We listen to our thoughts. Sometimes when a negative thought comes our way, we tend to invest into that thought more and more and more and then you have given so much of thought into that particular thought where that thought has now become so heavy to an extent where it can become a stronghold of the enemy. And how does the enemy create strongholds in the mind is only when you entertain certain thoughts. That's why I always tell you when you hear the enemy, if you hear the enemy talking to you, for goodness sake, please shut the enemy then and there. You have to draw the line. As a child of God, you must know where to draw the line. What you are required to do is only to have a dialogue with the Holy Spirit. Talk to the Holy Spirit. That is the only thing that you are required to do. So when Jesus shut him up, he wasn't deceived by the interruption. He wasn't afraid of the interruption. Jesus was neither entertaining this interruption. The third important thing Jesus teaches us here is Jesus didn't waste time casting out the unclean spirit. 
Jesus didn't waste time casting out the unclean spirit out of this person. The Bible doesn't say when you know the unclean spirit cried out of this person. Jesus didn't look at the disciples and say, okay, you know what? There's a major interruption. Let's come back tomorrow. No, Jesus dealt with the situation then and there. The same way you need to deal with demonic situations that you come across in your life as and when they happen. Don't delay. For example, you must know when you have a strong relationship with the Holy Spirit, he will help you to master your thoughts to a certain extent. Now, don't get me wrong. We will, we will not be able to do this perfectly because we, none of us are perfect. But that's where we serve a God who is perfect in all his ways. Because you need to watch over your thought life. You have to pay attention to your thoughts. You must know to dissect the thoughts, to separate the thoughts that comes from the enemy. From the thoughts that you know the Holy Spirit has given birth to. That separation is vital. Why do you think Christians, precious Christians commit suicide today? There are Christians who have committed suicide. There are Christians, as we are speaking, there are Christians right now who are contemplating committing suicide. In time to come, you will hear the sad news about precious Christians committing suicide. Why is that? Because they invest so much of their energy into these suicidal thoughts that the enemy brings. Does God bring suicidal thoughts? Absolutely not. It's the enemy. So people get carried away with these thoughts. They waste time with these thoughts and they don't deal with these thoughts. Jesus didn't waste time casting out the unclean spirit out of this person because Mark chapter 1 verse 25 and 26 says, Jesus shut him up and he said, quiet, get out of here at that very moment. And their afflicting spirit threw the man onto the ground protesting loudly, and finally it came out of the person. You know, it takes only one command to the enemy. You know, when you hear a lie from the enemy, it takes only one command to come out of your mouth and say, enemy, you shut up. You have no right in my life. I command this ungodly thought to get out of my mind right now in the name of Jesus. It takes just one command for the enemy to take his foot out of your mind. So don't pay it's time dwelling in ungodly thoughts. The enemy tries to deposit into your mind because what happens is, please listen to this, the more you invest your energy into these ungodly thoughts, that's how it ends up becoming a stronghold. Don't entertain the enemy when you have identified his work. This is what Jesus teaches us here. Jesus identified the work of the enemy in this man's life. And Jesus, did he entertain it even for a minute? No. The immediate response was, you come out of it in the day. Jesus didn't have to say in my name because he, he was present there. But for you and I today, in the name of Jesus is how we cast out demons. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 16, verse number 20 says, the God of our peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Romans chapter 16, verse number 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Can I tell you a powerful way for you to exercise or for you to have victory over your thoughts? Speak scripture into your thoughts. Whenever an ungodly thought crosses your mind, rebuke it and speak and declare scripture. Because the Bible says God's word will never return back to him empty-handed without accomplishing what his word says. For example, when the word says in Romans 16 verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The enemy can't stand that because that's the word of God. Because the enemy knows the word. That's why the Bible says you resist the enemy and the enemy will flee from you. How do you resist the enemy 
is written the word of God. You must learn to resist the enemy with the word of God. That is why the Bible says the word of God is powerful. It's alive and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. No fiery dart the enemy sends your way can stand against the word of God. Hallelujah. The fourth important lesson Jesus teaches us here. Now it gets even more interesting. Now we are going to spend a little bit more time here in the fourth point. The fourth point is Jesus preached a doctrine that does what it says. Jesus preached a doctrine that does what it says. Praise be to his holy name. This is what we see now. I'm going to read to you verse 27 and 28. Everyone there was spellbound, buzzing with curiosity, saying, what's going on here? A new teaching that does what it says. Look at what the people say. This is a new teaching that does what it says. He shuts up defiling demonic spirits and tells them to get lost. News of this traveled fast and soon all over Galilee. Jesus' doctrine, he preached a doctrine that does what it says. Now, what is the doctrine you preach today? What is the doctrine you believe today? Does your words carry life? When you command the sick to be healed, do you see the sick being healed? When you cast out demons, when you command them to live in the name of Jesus, do you see them leaving? You, this will happen if you follow the footsteps of the doctrine of Jesus. That's why I tell you, we need to follow the New Test, the pattern of New Testament evangelism established by Jesus. Because Jesus preached a doctrine that does what it says now. Let me share two powerful components of his doctrine. The doctrine of Jesus, what he shared, is full of authority and power. It's full of authority and power. How do we know this? In verse number 21 and verse number 22, the Bible says, when they entered Capernaum, the Sabbath arrived, Jesus lost no time in getting to the meeting place. He spent the day there teaching. And the people there, they were surprised at his teaching because it was so forthright, so confident, full of authority, not quibbling and quoting like the religious scholars. What Jesus preached carried life. You need to understand the words of Jesus still manifest even today. The words of Jesus still manifest even today. Why? Because there is a spirit that works behind his word who is the great Holy Spirit of God. Wherever the word of God is spoken without the Holy Spirit of God behind it, there will be no power. There will be no results when the word of God is taught without the Holy Spirit being in the picture. That is what we call powerless Christianity. That is what these religious people were doing. Because they were good at quibbling and quoting the scriptures. They knew it. But they were not firmly rooted in the spirit. This is why we need to be filled by the spirit day in and day out. We need to keep the fire of the Holy Spirit burning inside of us every single day. You know, when it, whenever there is a power cut, you know, long years ago when we didn't have these, uh, these torches and whatnot, you know, we used to light candles. I can remember when I was small, you know, when we had power cuts in Sri Lanka, we used to light candles. And we will always be watching the candle. The moment is about, you know, when the flame is about to go out, you know, we will bring another candle. We will do whatever, you know, we will even cover the candle with our hands like this, you know, so that the, the flame will not go out. So we used to do things like this to keep the flame burning. To keep the fire going. Now, my question to you today, including me, what do we do to keep the fire of the Holy Spirit burning inside of us every single day? 
We have to do that because unless otherwise we will not be functioning in the power and authority that Jesus wants us to function in. The next component is the doctrine that Jesus taught includes casting out demons. And I feel sorry for those pastors who preach the gospel and they say things like, no, we don't have to cast out demons. They turn a blind eye on the existence of demons. There are people like that in Christianity today. They turn a blind eye on the existence of the demons. Mark chapter 16, verse number 17 and 18. What does the Bible say? The words of Jesus in Mark chapter 16, verse number 17 and 18. Jesus says, these signs will accompany those who have believed. In my name, they will cast out demons. Then he says, they will speak with new tongues. Verse 18, they will pick up serpents and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. But can you see the very first thing that Jesus tells? Jesus did not say, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And thereafter, he, did not, he didn't say that in my name, you will cast out demons. That is the first thing Jesus said. In my name, they will cast out demons. Now, my precious people of God, before you cast out demons in another person that is in front of you, you need to get rid of the enemy who is already inside of you. I've said that as plainly as I can. Before you, you no know, try to get rid of, this is why Jesus said, you know, don't try to cast out the moat that is in the eye of your brother. First, get rid of, first you deal with the beam that is in your own eye. And by doing that, you will be able to clearly see what is exactly wrong with your brother or your sister. Deal with yourself first. This is where the Holy Spirit sheds light into your inner being to help you understand the areas where you are struggling. Every single day, we need help. You need help. I need help just because I'm a pastor, just because I'm a servant of God. That does not exclude me from needing the help of the Holy Spirit. We all need his help. And the moment I said we all need help, we are getting a call from help. Hallelujah. I, I don't know if you heard the phone ringing. Hallelujah. But all of us, we need help from the precious Holy Spirit of God day in and day out. Don't entertain the work of the enemy in your life. For example, if you know you are having thoughts of anger towards someone, don't entertain those thoughts. Go on your knees. Ask the help of the Holy Spirit because there is very little that you can do in your own strength. In order for you to experience complete deliverance, you need 100% help of the Holy Spirit. There is something called self-deliverance. I've shared this even in the book that I released last year. You need to experience self-deliverance. When you know that there are carrying thoughts of unforgiveness in your heart, when you have hatred towards someone, that is a sign that you need to deal with that. Because the more, the, the more you let those that anger and bitterness rest in your heart, after a while it will become such a powerful stronghold where the enemy is now trying to triumph over it. You got to deal with yourself first. And no Christian is excluded from doing that. If a pastor comes and says, it's only you who has got to do it, I am excluded. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Every single person, every child of God, every minister, every evangelist, every pastor, needs deliverance. None of us are perfect. So my precious people of God, deal with yourself first. With that, we come to the fifth important lesson that we can learn from Jesus. Now here's another interesting one. Jesus determined what the demons had to do, not the other way around. Jesus determined what the demons had to do, and it was not the other way around. The demons were not the ones 
who dictated terms and conditions to Jesus. Jesus determined what the demons had to do. When you read verse number 32 and 34, the Bible says that evening after the sun was down, now this is after, you know, after this man was delivered, the Bible says Jesus went to the house of Peter and Peter's uh, uh, mother-in-law was having fever and Jesus healed her. And after that, the Bible says in verse number 32 onwards, that evening after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil affected, afflicted people to him. The whole city lined up at his door. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits. Because the demons knew his true identity, he didn't let them say a word. Look at how Jesus controlled these demons. Because the demons knew his true identity, he didn't let them say a word. You know, when, when, cast, when it comes to casting out demons, you must know how to exercise authority over them. I can remember one day while we were casting out a demon you know, from a little boy. Uh, not, not little, there was a little boy in that room. And suddenly the demon pointed at the little boy who was in that room and said, okay, if I am to leave, if I am to get out of this body, can I enter into this little boy? So at that moment, we said, no, you have no permission to enter into this boy. And we cover that room under the blood of Jesus. You need to know that you have authority over the demonic realm. Like I said, don't wait until you see a manifestation in another person. Start with yourself. You have to determine the state of your inner being. It is you who determine the quality of your inner being. Please don't ever forget that. It is you who determine the quality of your thoughts. The quality of your inward nature is something that is determined by you. Because if you turn an eye of ignorance towards what the enemy is doing inside of you, ignorance will only become an asset in the hands of the enemy. This is why the Bible says in the book of Corinthians, don't entertain ignorance. Do not entertain ignorance. Now, Jesus determined what the demons had to do. It was not the other way around. And I'm going to share three references from scripture about the controlling nature of demons. Why do I say that you need to have authority over your inner self? Is because demons, unclean spirits, they have a controlling nature. When, when a thought ends up becoming a stronghold, the enemy will control you through that stronghold. For example, if you are having hatred towards a particular uh, kind of people, a group of people, every time you come across that group of people, there will be you know, anger towards them. You will not even smile when you talk to that, uh, those kind of people. And little do you know why you are reacting like that it's because of what the enemy has done inside of you. Do you know, quite often, the way when you look at how people react towards others, it's not because they want to react like that. It's because of underlying work of the enemy that has gone, that has, that has go, gone unnoticed. It's mainly because of that. Now, let me share three examples from scripture. Example number one, the boy who was brought to the disciples when Jesus was up in the Mount of Transfiguration. We see this in Matthew chapter 17, but I'm going to share from Mark, Mark chapter 9 where we find the same incident recorded. Mark chapter 9, verse 17 and 18. A man in the crowd answered, now this is after Jesus came down from the mountain. Teacher, I brought to you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of his speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He forms at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Now, do you see the controlling na nature of this demon? Because the father says, the moment it seizes him, in verse number 18, he says, it throws my son 
to the ground. He forms at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. Demons are so controlling. Jesus, thank God Jesus was there at that time. Because the disciples, they were not able to cast this demon out. You see, if you continue reading this story, Jesus actually got a bit annoyed. He finally, you know, he cast out the demon. Then the disciples took him to a side and asked, why couldn't we do it? Jesus said, because of your unbelief. And also Jesus gave them instructions saying, you need to fast and pray. You need to understand there is a controlling nature of demons. Very often, sometimes when you look at how people react, I will come across people, you know, where you can't say something, they get fired up, they get so, you know, full of anger. They react towards you with a lot of anger and rage. Can I tell you the reason why? It could very well be because of a demon of rage inside of that person. Doesn't matter if that person is a Christian. Doesn't matter at all. That is why it's important for these issues to be dealt with. And Christians, we are not you know, uh, focusing on unbelievers. We are focusing on Christians. Christians need deliverance. Christians need help. Every single day from the precious Holy Spirit of God. Example number two, the demon possessed man from Gadara. Now with all these ex uh, examples, I'm showing you the controlling nature of demons. The demon possessed man from Gadara, we find in Mark chapter five, I'm going to read to you from verses one to five. Then they, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. What a sad state of a precious, precious person who were doing things out of his, you know, he, he was not doing those things because he wanted to do those things, but the demon inside of that person, do you think a person will want, no, will voluntarily take stones and cut themselves? No, it's demons that compel people to do things like that. And the Bible says this is a person who couldn't be tamed, this person is not being able to tame by anyone because of the strength of the demon that was inside of him. They couldn't even bind him with chains. This man easily tore apart these chains. And in the nights, he would spend time, he would sleep in the tombs, in the mountains. And he'll cry in the night. He will shout. And he'll take stones and scrape and cut himself with stones. Not because he wanted to do these things to him. Not because he wanted to help him to, to do these things. But it's the demon who made this person do all these things. I will share the third uh, reference, third example, and we'll, we'll stop there because I can see that I have shared for nearly 40 minutes or so. That's good for today. and We will carry on with the we'll continue with next week. The third example is the sons of Sceva. The sons of Sceva we find in Acts chapter 19 verses 11 to 16 is what I'm going to read. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. And their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims, the seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were twins. Now look at what happened. 
verse number 15. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the, the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Look at the controlling nature of the enemy. This is why you need to spend time with the Holy Spirit every single day because you need to pay attention to your innermost being. You need to know what kind of thoughts you are entertaining in your mind. Somewhere down the line, you, know, you, might, you might just slip and you might end up hurting someone. But you need to put things right. You need to tell yourself, you have to point out to yourself where you are going wrong. Today, Christians are very good at pointing out areas where others are going wrong to them. But they don't point the areas where they are going wrong to themselves. That is where things begin. And as long as you can identify your very own mistakes that needs correction, that is where everything begins. Before we help someone, you need to help yourself. Before I help someone else, I need to help myself. So my precious people of God, pay attention. Just like Jesus determined what the demons had to do. It wasn't the other way around. Don't let demons get you to do things that you don't want to do. It may surprise you if you spend time with the Holy Spirit. He might even show you things that you are doing that you thought that you are doing out of your own will. But if you look at the root of where all that is coming from, it's only when the Holy Spirit shows you, you will know you are doing those things because the enemy is fooling you. It's filling you with negative thoughts to behave like that, to react like that. And I will close with this before we go into a time of ministry. You know, you needing help does not mean when someone comes your way and asks you, oh, how are you doing? If you are genuinely in a struggle, you need to be open. You need to say, I need help. Because people don't know, or because some Christians are too proud to say, I need help. That's where they really fall. You know, the Holy Spirit reminded me of something this morning. Something sad, actually, because in our, in our previous ministry, there's a precious brother. He was powerfully used by the Lord. He and a person who was married and later on, you know, he fell in you know, adultery. He had an affair with another uh, girl. You know, the Holy Spirit reminded me there were at least three or four times where I have spoken to him after the Sunday service. And I asked him this question very specifically. I asked him, how are you doing? How are things? I didn't know something like this was going on. But I was prompted to ask him, how are you doing? How are things with you? To which he said, oh, things are fantastic. That's the only way he answered. The only word he used to explain how he was doing at that moment is fantastic. 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 And maybe when he said fantastic, he was referring to all these other ungodly things that were happening. This is an area where Christians need to learn to be humble. Because you can have so much of pride in your heart and deceive someone else. But when the enemy deceives you, the enemy will slap you left, right and center when it comes to that final moment. You know, you can't, uh, there's this funny uh, term that one of my teachers used to scold me during school days. You know, when, whenever my parents had to come to school for parents' teachers' meetings, she always used to tell my parents, this fellow is always jig dancing. It's always jig dancing in the class. It's not paying attention. The same way you get Christians today who are jig dancing with the enemy today. They are doing the salsa, the zumba, you name it, everything, they dance it with the enemy. And little do they know it comes to a point where you know, there are Christians who think that they can live in all these ungodly things 
forever. It doesn't happen like that. It comes to a place, it comes to a point where the enemy takes it to a completely different level to expose that into the world because by exposing them into the world, the enemy receives, he gains the upper hand. So I know that you know, now you have started praying because all of a sudden my complexion has got a bit dark. Don't worry, it's just a power cut here. And we will get into a time of ministry. You know, that is maybe God's way of telling enough, son, enough. You, know, you also need to learn how to, to you know, go a bit easy with your words. Now you know, let's worship. Hallelujah. <laughs> so I pray that you will continue to spend time, you know, reading and listening to this message again and again and let the Holy Spirit of God continue to minister to you. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. And let's, let's continue to worship Jesus. Hallelujah. Ramatama. Zimati kadang-kadang.